Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters, welcome back. In this exciting episode, we're highlighting some of the experts that attended the Innovations and Climate Resilience Conference hosted by Patel. I attended the event earlier this year, and I'm excited to share the expertise from some of the attendees and speakers. You'll hear experts weigh in on topics such as national security, climate risk modeling, public health and climate justice, adapting to the built environment, and much more. The three-day conference was held in Columbus, Ohio. I've been to multiple adaptation conferences, and this was one of the most eclectic ones, attracting experts and practitioners from the private sector, NGOs, federal, state, and local governments. And as you'll hear in the episode, a key participant in the conference were representatives from the national labs. These are my first guests on the podcast from these labs. They're doing some really innovative work in the resilience space, and I'm thrilled to share their story on the podcast. You'll also hear from the diverse range of resilience experts from Battelle, the conference organizer. I was definitely inspired by attending the conference. The adaptation universe keeps getting bigger, and more people are discovering the work they do is relevant to this field. This ongoing conference is driving urgent conversations around climate change adaptation and showcasing groundbreaking solutions that will shape our future. Now, let's get this episode started with the CEO and president of Patel, Lou Von Thayer. Hey, Adapters, I'm here with the president and CEO of Patel, Lou Von Thayer. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. So we're here at the conference. Can you give us a little bit of background first about Patel? Yeah, so Battelle is a company that's over 90 years old. We're one of the largest nonprofit R&D organizations in the world, and we're really focused on climate change, national laboratories, and research in the nation. Can you tell us a bit about your goals for this conference? And it's the second conference, right? It is. We're trying to bring people together between government organizations, universities, private companies, and really try to get to the facts of how do we build not only climate carbon reduction, but resilience into the solutions and where we're spending a lot of our national treasure in the coming decades. How can we make sure we're doing solutions that really work? Tell us a bit about what has changed since last year's conference. You know, so much. We've watched the Ukraine war start. We've watched China's position become a little bit more clear. We've seen massive government investments coming from the Biden administration that are going to give us the opportunity to really attack a lot of these technologies that could make a big difference in how technology helps us solve these climate problems. Patel does a lot of things, and I have learned a ton. I'm, okay, national security, and it's been surprising how much you're involved in. Trainings are a big part of what you do, and a lot of groups just aren't familiar with even the whole notion of climate resilience and climate adaptation. What are you guys planning in that area? Yes. Yeah, so on the training side, we're really trying to make sure we get a debate started based upon fact and what I call system engineering, making sure we're looking at the whole ecosystem. Building a product that takes more carbon to build than it ever offsets during its life is not going to help us solve this problem. And how we use our national treasure, particularly our government taxpayer assets, we would like to keep those debates going and built in a way that we're training people, developing people, really teaching people to look at the whole soup to nuts story and making sure the solutions that we ultimately invest in are ones that will actually cut carbon over time, cut pollution over time, and get us to where we want to go in the long term, which is a carbon neutral society. You talked a bit about it at the beginning of this and in during your presentation, but just maybe elaborate a bit more. The federal government has just sent a lot of investment this way. What are some of the opportunities? So many. In the national laboratories, we're going to hear about fusion in a little bit here and some breakthroughs that have happened there. We're looking at small modular reactor technologies, the technologies that hopefully, if we can get the regulatory environment right, will make it cheaper and faster to build smaller nuclear plants that can scale for communities and, and be safer than technologies we've had in the past. Huge opportunities in hydrogen is can we make hydrogen a sustainable and economic? We can definitely work it from a technology standpoint. Can we make it an economic solution? Better ways for wind power, batteries. One of the problems with solar and, and wind is they don't work when the wind's not blowing and the sun doesn't shine. So can you store more of that energy at a grid scale and can you do it economically? Lots of money being invested in those technologies. Uh, we'll play in that. So will many partners and many others around the world. And of course, we want to make sure the United States stays competitive and can be bring forward the solutions to these problems. So I have a lot of university-level listeners, and they are very interested in getting into the adaptation space. Youth engagement and just engaging younger professionals is really important to what you're doing. Yes, all the way down to um, we're incredibly focused on STEM education. Economies will go up and down over time, but we have a national shortage of engineers and scientists. So we at Patel are passionate, and I'm personally passionate as a first-generation college student myself, at really introducing kids 
and students, young students, to science. Teach them that it's not rocket science, per se, that it's actually a lot of fun. It's how the world works. We set aside a goal five years ago. We were impacting about 100,000 students a year that we wanted to get to a million by 2025. We actually hit 1.4 million last year. We actually run a high school here in town. We're just breaking ground on a money raise we've done to build a second where every student for 17 years coming from a tough school district has graduated and 90% have gone to college. So we're really trying to build and encourage that next generation and basically replace ourselves with a smarter, bigger generation in the future. Okay, before I let you go, you gave a young woman an award today. What was that about? Yeah, so we did our first time. We wanted to start integrating the next generation in STEM education into this conference. So we did a nationwide challenge for high school students across the country. And a young woman from California won that challenge. She came up with an idea that, quite frankly, my research engineers thought it was as good as you would hear from most of our engineers. And she's still in high school, so she's a lot smarter than I was, on how do you see grasses in different ways to stop soil erosion. So she's actually going to present that in a poster session this afternoon. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested to see that. And with that, we're giving her and her high school a grant. And she's a little young yet, but we've actually offered her an internship at Patel when she gets into college. (laughs) Fantastic. Thanks for joining the podcast. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Hey, Adapters. I'm back, and I'm with... Holly Niebuhr. Okay, where do you work? I am CEO of AEI Consultants. Tell us about that. What do you guys do there? So we do all types of property assessments, from environmental site assessments to property condition to seismic risk assessments to support people in the commercial real estate industry who are wanting to make sure they're making good decisions when they're buying or developing or financing real estate assets. All right. Tell us a bit about how climate resilience, climate adaptation plays into what you do. So over the last five years, I would say we've had increasing demand from our client base to understand how climate risk is informing their due diligence and risk management processes. So for instance, we have a lot of major lending institutions, real estate investment trusts that are now incorporating climate risk and natural hazards into their risk management processes. And they're looking at How can we consider that in the context of the existing risk management processes like environmental contamination concerns or property condition condition issues of like the roof, the elevator, how is the paving at the facility? People are already looking at that, and now they're trying to understand how climate risk is impacting those considerations. There are some technical aspects about that. Is that something that you do in-house, or are you always on the lookout for like, okay, this is going to help me do my job better? Right. So there are a number of climate risk and natural hazard maps and models that are available. And I think you may have mentioned this in the past, the Wild West of climate modeling. And we definitely see that as the case. We have a lot of clients coming to us that have already made some agreement with one of those climate mapping and modeling companies and others that are coming to us and asking, who should we use? (laughs) What kind of information should we look for? And I'm really finding that there's a lot of variation in the quality of the data data that's available, and we're really helping clients to understand what's the best source for that information, and maybe even checking multiple sources where necessary and where it's a really high-stakes decision. So I've talked about how even local governments might not have the technical sophistication to even understand what a good model is. Is that an area of expertise? How do you figure out? How do you understand if a model's good? (laughs) That's a great question. I think there are a lot of institutions out there that are building their capacity on this, and we're learning along with everyone else. One example that I would share is the reinsurance industry has come together with the forward-looking climate risk maps and models to combine the CAT models with the climate models. We do have a little bit extra level of trust with the reinsurance industry because they do have skin in the game. So spend a lot of time talking to people and learning about what they're doing, what the pros and cons of the different models are that they've built. Tell me a bit about your time here at the conference. What are you learning? What sort of surprised you? I'm having a great time at the conference. I'm learning a lot. I do wish that there was more representation from the private sector. And again, as I mentioned, I'm with the kind of commercial real estate side of really everyone who owns privately held real estate. It's a vast amount of the commercial real estate in this country is held by private entities and is financed by lenders. And those folks are not here at this conference, and I really wish that they were. I'm hearing a lot about the national labs and community 
cities and agencies who are developing their own climate risk maps, models, and processes. And I find that there's probably a lot of duplication of effort, and we could join forces and really help each other if we connect more across those silos. Briefly, tell me a bit about the poster presentation that you're doing here. Okay, so we are here to talk to this community about an ASTM standard. ASTM International is a consensus-based standards making organization and we have been working for the last two years on developing what's called a property resilience assessment which is a three-stage process first screening for the natural hazards and climate risks that may affect a property second identifying how vulnerable is the property to those risks and third identifying resilience measures and this type of assessment we see as aligned with the existing due diligence and risk management assessments that are already ubiquitous in commercial real estate transactions and finance. Battelle seems committed to having these conferences. This is their second one. So if they do a third one, what would you like to see there? And I know you talked about private sector, but maybe some other content that you might want to see there. I think the more we can take the conceptual discussions of the risks and why it's important and bring that down to the property level, certainly community resilience is a huge part of this, but the commercial real estate assets that make up a vast majority of the communities, those two communities need to work together, the private sector and the public sector. So I would like to see more on that at the future conferences. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. Hey, Adapters, we're back, and I'm with... Dr. Jordan Branham. I'm a Senior Climate Risk and Resilience Analyst at Argonne National Laboratory. Okay, tell us a little bit about that laboratory. It's hard to put it into just one word. There's about 4,500 of us working on a range of big issues, from nuclear technology to energy systems to, more and more often, climate resilience and how we adapt our communities. You gave a presentation yesterday, and I actually even had a question. I went up afterwards because I was so inspired by what you were talking about. Give us an overview. So I was talking mainly about the Climate Risk and Resilience Portal, or CLIMER, that was released back in November. And it is an attempt to bring Argonne's vast climate data and climate modeling work out into the public sphere. So it's a free, equal access platform where individuals can go and access this really high quality, dynamically downscaled climate data and then use that however they wish, whether it's for planning or for infrastructure owners seeking to harden their infrastructure. It can be used across all different sorts of, of contexts. Okay, help us visualize that. So it's this portal. Is someone sitting in front of a computer and there's an interface? I mean, how would they even approach using it? Yeah, so right now it's got two different ways in which you can primarily interact with the system. So one is you can actually go in and type in an address or drop a point anywhere in the continental U.S., and it will summarize for that area all of the climate variables we currently have in there for that area. So it'll tell you the historical temperatures, the mid-century projections under two scenarios, the end-of-century projections under two scenarios. So you can kind of get that one picture if that's what you're interested in. What's happening to my community? You can go use that tool. If you're interested in bigger picture aspect, we have the data explorers where you can go in and kind of see different data layers, mid-century projections, end-of-century projections over the entire U.S. You can kind of look at this at the scale you're interested in. If you're interested in a bigger regional picture, statewide picture, that's kind of the tool for you. And then the data explorers are really designed currently and will be designed more and more to be hopefully a one-stop shop for climate resilience work where it integrates with the resilience analysis and planning tool, which is FEMA's community-centric, infrastructure-centric. It's got demographic data, census data, all of those features, information on hospitals and electricity infrastructure. So you can port all of that data in pretty easily and then get a good picture of, okay, how does this future climate interact with some of the demographic features I'm interested in addressing in my community? This portal was created. Obviously, it's a tool for people to use. What's a bit of the history, though? Was there this demand from people outside the lab? How does that kind of work where you decide, okay, this is what we think they want to be using? Yeah, so I got to give a lot of credit to AT&T, actually. They are some of the original instigators behind this. They came to Argon many years ago and said, we want to start addressing our climate risk. Can you help us with that? And over a partnership of many years, it's kind of grown to a point where there is all of this data out there. And as AT&T will tell you, 
them working in silo on their climate resilience, it's not really helpful because they're just one part of a community. They want everybody to be resilient to climate change. So it's not just telecom, but it's also utilities. It's also the people. So they have been a big partner, both financially and just in terms of getting the word out about this data and kind of being the instigator behind, let's make this into a portal. Let's make it so it's public so that everybody can kind of take advantage of this work that we've seen done in the background for many years. So the question I asked you, which I don't think you were necessarily happy with, is that we see the private sector coming up with some of these modeling tools and it immediately comes to like, well, why should I go to the private sector if they're going to charge me and you've got this free product or is your product just as good as their product? And it's all very confusing for end users. Yeah, and this is one of those things where it's a little bit of the wild, wild west out there right now with climate resilience work. And to a certain degree, that's awesome because there's so much interest in this data and in finding out more about climate risk. And there's a bunch of people that are trying to help out with that need or, you know, fulfill that need. So that part's great. On the other hand, for end users, it's the wild, wild west. You have no idea where to go. There's 10, 15, 20 different good options for where you can go for your data. And we at Argon don't really want to be the the individuals telling you, you should be using this product. You shouldn't be using this product. This product's better for X, Y, Z. We can really tell you about our product, which is that the data that underlies this portal is some of the highest quality that you can really get access to out there. Uh, last question is just what you've been here at the conference and anything that stood out, people you've been meeting, presentations that you've been hearing? Oh, man, that's a good question. I think part of it is just the breadth of great work that's being done out there and the big issues that we're facing, like just things I don't even really think about. As big issues come here and you realize, wow, that's a really critical issue, such as like uh, access to raw materials and mining. Those are big things we need to be able to solve as climate researchers. And it, it really just highlights the need for more work in this space and more investment in this space. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, Adapters, I'm with Dr. Paula Maybe. I'm the Chief Scientist and Observatory Director of the National Ecological Observatory Network, also known as NEON, operated by Battelle. We've heard a lot of acronyms at this conference, but I think you have the best one, so that's good. Tell us a bit about NEON. NEON is an amazing federal investment that was stood up at least 20 years ago through the vision of the scientific community who recognized that more data to understand our ecosystems, the fundamental nature of our ecosystems, was needed at a continental scale. Help my listeners visualize that. So are there particular ecosystems that you're focusing on or is there a mix of all ecosystems? So this network, is, it's a distributed network. So unlike other observatories like astronomical observatories that are pointed at the sky, this observatory is, is an observatory of Earth. It covers a quarter of the latitudes and longitudes of our planet. And we have sites distributed from Alaska in the north, north slope of Alaska, actually, to Hawaii in the Pacific, Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, and 24 other states in between. So across those different regions of the United States, we have 20 different eco-climatic domains, that's short for saying, 20 basically very different ecosystems in which we have scattered 81 different sampling sites, both aquatic and terrestrial. And across those sites, you ready for this? <laughs> we have a sensor network, so over 11,000 sensors monitoring air, all kinds of stuff. We have remote sensing planes carrying hyperspectral imagery, LIDAR, and other remote sensing machinery. And we also have lots of people on the ground, almost 400 people on the ground, doing what I think people, most people imagine field ecologists doing, which is doing a lot of sampling, collection of, of data, and that's both a, a permanent and a seasonal workforce. So it's a long enough data set that you're probably seeing changes on it. Can you just really quickly maybe tell us a few of those? Yeah. So we began collecting from all of the sites, full operations, initialized about three and a half years ago. So this is an observatory that stood up for a 30-year time span. So that's an ecological time span against which trends in the climate should be visible. And so at this point, only three and a half years of full data across all the, the sites, there are still some trends that are visible. For example, range extensions of some of the organisms that we sample and lots of other kinds of uses of the data. But in terms of those types of trends, that's a big one. 
All right, so who might be some partners that actually use this data? Oh, that's a great question. We have a large number of partners across scientific societies, individual science organizations, as well as institutions, and all the federal agencies. So over a 100 different kinds of partners helping us in different sectors of what we do, which is basically produce this enormous data. Approximately, for the interested users, 400 terabytes a year, most of it airborne data, the remote sensing data. So a lot of interest seems to come from NASA, for example, and as well as the individuals using NASA data to ground truth satellite data and remote sensing data against the ground-based data that we are collecting. So, for example, we collect a lot of vegetation data, so identify the plants animals on the ground, but the plant data and the forest data connected with this hyperspectral data allow this autumn and and combined with some really new ML and AI techniques allow you to basically visualize and understand what's on earth at a large scale. So I have a lot of listeners work for state government, work for local governments, organizations. Are these the type of folks that could take advantage of the information that you're generating there? Yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. So we produce over 180 different types of data products across you know, hydrology and geochemistry and atmospheric data and much, much more. So it's a large amount of data. And those data are free and openly available and they're standardized. I think I forgot to mention that before, but this is a really profound aspect of NEON, that the data are collected using the same protocols in the tundra, like Alaska, as in the tropics, as in Puerto Rico. And that is not a trivial matter. There are very different kinds of forests, different kinds of vegetation, different kinds of environments that we're working in. And so this team, essentially this effort, this big federal investment over the all the years of construction was also constructing these interoperable protocols where they could not be adapted from ones that were existing from in other partners. It's always re- important to re to not reinvent standards, but to use the ones and best practices that exist. But this team actually had a lot to do with reusing standards where they existed from networks like the Long-Term Ecological Research Network and other agencies, as well as developing their own. So yes, open, free, interoperable data, interoperable means you can compare it easily and compute on it together because it's the same data being collected across all these sites. Again, very, very different from regional ecology or local scale ecology, which is critically important as well, but on just a simply a different scale. Okay, so we're at this Innovation and Climate Resilience Conference. How do you see the work at NEON playing into resilience? Many different ways. So I think this is, everyone is leaning in the same direction at this conference, especially in light of the IPCC synthesis report that came out last week. A lot of concern. This is the right time to move on this. So I think a lot of people are curious about the NEON data and looking where they can leverage it to make an impact in climate resilience and adaptability. So I'm really, really pleased about that. NEON does more than simply offer these data through our website and actually through the through cloud environment. But we also are here to help anyone who wants our help with, for example, additional field collection for data that we may not collect, but somebody else wants to collect. So you can write a proposal, write us into the proposal for that type of contract work. We have people who are specialized in all aspects of cyber infrastructure that quite a lot to release all of these data to the public. We can help people with that as well. I'd like our free and open data to be used. Of course, it's a massive federal investment. But I'd also like people to know that we're here to work with you as you develop proposals, as you seek to understand aspects of the environment that are critical to the efforts that you are making. Thanks for joining the podcast. Thank you. Hey, Adapters, I'm back and I'm with Andy Bachman. All right, Andy, where do you work? I work in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is my home office. I work for and with folks at the Idaho National Lab in Idaho Falls, Idaho, which is also part of the Department of Energy Complex of National Labs. You have a bit of an interesting background in the work that you do with the lab. What is it? Is it isn't directly related to resilience, but you're getting into that space, right? Yeah, it's sort of coming at it sideways. My job is to be on the lookout for anything that could cause harm to the electric grid, the North American electric grid. And up until recently, the last few years, that's been primarily from a cybersecurity perspective, nation state level cyber attacks. 
But a few years ago, I started noticing, it wasn't too hard to notice, right, that uh, physical climate risks were starting to pound on infrastructure and that we'd better start doing something proactively if we wanted to keep the whole thing running. I guess just quickly, what what are some of those? I think of wildfire, but I guess hurricanes could play a role. Are you kind of looking at the whole United States and what climate impacts could have affected even today? Yeah, no problem. I tend to start off with a little alliteration, flood, fire, freeze, and then you can take off from there. But those three different phenomena have affected generation stations, substations, transmission and distribution lines, control centers. They clearly affect the folks that are using the electricity. You know, when you get a heat wave or a heat dome, you end up both putting the electric utilities under stress because their equipment is having a hard time making and moving electricity as efficiently as it normally does on a, on a cooler day. And that's paired with the fact that the users of electricity, the consumers, they're cranking up their air conditioners, depending where you are in the country. And so it creates a double trouble when you have high heat events. One thing we know for sure is that heat while other phenomena vary, the heat is going up year upon year. They passed this big infrastructure bill, and a lot of that's going to go for grid and roads and such. Are those people out there? I mean, that gets down to the local government level. But the work that you do, are they going to be aware of the information that you have? Because they're going to start having to plan for climate impacts. How does that information flow happen? I don't know. From my review of the legislation and the bills that have passed, it's impressive how much money has been put towards these climate issues. I did notice. And maybe I misread or missed something, but even in packages that purport to be for resilience and adaptation, I still read more mitigation. And I have to always say I'm not anti-mitigation. We need to do such a better job at reducing emissions in every way possible. But I still don't see as much as I would like in terms of acknowledging that the impacts are landing, they're going to hit harder And we need to get out in front of them using climate models to understand what's coming, where, and when, and then start to identify infrastructure assets, prioritizing by criticality, and begin hardening measures to make sure they can continue performing their function for civilization, for the country, for the communities, as long as they're supposed to. Okay, so we're here at this Patel Conference, Innovation Climate Resilience, and you actually played a role. I I guess there was an organizing committee or like a content committee. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that's right. I think yeah, I think they call it steering committee, but it's it's any of those things. People that are meeting all year, talking about the structure and the content, soliciting abstracts from would be presenters, and then when those abstracts come in, evaluating them, deciding which topic to tag them with, which ones should get bigger time on stage, which ones get relegated to less time, and then helping to uh, moderate those folks when they do get a chance up on their platform to give their talk. I was on it last year too. I think this year we tried to push it more towards adaptation and resilience. You know, the title of the conference is Innovation and Climate Resilience, but just for a number of reasons that may not be worth unpacking here, it still tends to lean towards mitigation quite often. And we're trying to push it more and more and hopefully next year, even more into practical adaptation and resilience topics. So when you were seeing the content coming in for presentation ideas and such, any surprises were you just thinking, oh, you didn't even realize that these people were kind of doing this resilience work? No, I wouldn't say surprises. It's impressive. The national labs and academia And a handful of commercial companies were involved as well. It doesn't surprise me that they are doing a great job, from what I can tell, on working with climate data, converting it into models that can be used for scenarios, for planning purposes. That's getting better and better and better all the time. I'd say that what I'd like to see more of, both at this Battelle conference and everywhere, would be practical applications of that data. More engineering companies that are grabbing the models, putting them in front of their clients in energy and water and transportation, manufacturing, and saying, looks like you're going to have trouble with some of your buildings, some of your assets in the next 5, 10, 25 years. We need to get out in front of those things unless you want to fail. We need to get out in front of those things and start to consider hardening options. And I'll just say hardening option. This would fall under both adaptation sometimes and resilience. Harding option could be elevating something if it's in a flood area or undergrounding something if it's in a fire area or moving something or putting a wall around it or ballistically hardening it if it's in the Southeast and the hurricanes are hurling objects around with greater velocity, making sure that the equipment that we need to keep civilization going 
can withstand these different forces. Before I let you go, any highlights from the conference that stood out for you? I'll just, sure. I just, I think at the very beginning from our other talks, Doug, you know, I'm somewhat pessimistic about these matters, about our ability as humans to muster the will to get out in front of these problems and be proactive rather than the reactive way we usually are. I loved that they opened the conference with the competition that they held for high school students to see who could come up with some really cool, innovative adaptation or resilience idea. And they found a young woman from California. I think you've posted on her already and her concept for seed bombs, for eelgrass, for erosion control, rebuilding areas. I thought that was just fantastic. So I got a nice little injection of optimism at the beginning of the conference and some of that carried through. Yeah, she was great. I commented that we have the next generation of adaptation professionals actually already doing some work. So that, that was very exciting. All right, Andy, it's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure hanging with you. We got to chat. We had dinner with some other, other folks there. It was really just a pleasure to meet so many different people who came to the conference. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks a lot, Doug, and keep doing what you're doing. Hey, adapters, I'm with... Dr. Shetha Chakraborty. I am the CEO of North America for We Don't Have Time, the world's largest social media for climate solutions. We actually know each other. We go a bit back when I was in D.C. and you were doing work with... The Center for Climate and Security. Many security professionals are actually here at the Battelle Conference. So you gave a presentation and give us a little bit of a sample of what you talked about. You'll remember, your listeners might remember that we talked about climate and security, and that's a major theme here at the ICR conference. I, however, my background is in behavioral science, and I apply behavioral science to crafting thoughtful communications to reach the widest audience as possible so we can actually predict behavioral change and align behavioral change to the climate data, to what we know we need people, individuals, communities, cities, states to do that prepares them for the impacts that are coming related to the planet warming. So that was the nature of my presentation today. You actually had a robust Q&A, right? I wasn't there. I didn't witness it. But what were some of the questions you were getting? Some of the questions were, what has the science community done so wrong all these decades that there still hasn't been enough movement by the public and by policymakers to protect ourselves, to build resiliency in the face of climate change. And the answer to that is really, even though scientists have known for decades the reality of what is coming with the planet warming, they haven't been able to communicate it well. And we can't blame scientists. Scientists aren't trained to communicate to the public, right? You produce the data, you put it out there, and you assume that the public and the policymakers are going to take that data and do what's appropriate with it. That hasn't been the case. People don't respond to information dumps. So no matter how much science, no matter how much evidence, no matter how much data we collect and we validate and we replicate and we put out there, the reality is unless you apply the science of science communication to communicating science, you're not going to get movement from the public and from policymakers. Ultimately, principles of behavioral science show you how to take that science data, translate it in a way that audiences receive it, it resonates, and that actual behavioral change occurs. You've got your finger in almost every aspect of climate change. It's my impression. So you know what's really going on out there. There aren't actually a lot of climate adaptation conferences. And Patel, this is their second year. Why do you think that we're not seeing more of those conferences? Do you think a lot of the sectors that it's relevant for just don't understand it's relevant to them? I think what we're seeing is a lot of hope for these major global convenings solving the problem. So by that, I mean the World Economic Forum. You see CEOs and so many representatives from the private sector congregating in Davos in Switzerland, this tiny little town in January that's impossible to get access to unless you really have the big bucks behind you. And I think that's turning off the wider public from participating in that kind of conversation, adaptation and mitigation. And then you have... South by Southwest, which is a little bit more accessible and domestic in the United States, but similarly really expensive to get to. And then you have Climate Week New York, which is picking up. The COPs, of course, the UN conferences. The next one will be in Dubai. Again, really prohibitive to attend. What I like to do is to give access to these conversations. So through the We Don't Have Time platform, we're able to live stream a lot of the content and allow people to engage that otherwise wouldn't be able to participate. And I think conferences like Battelle are picking up on that too by having these convenings and making these types of conversations accessible to a 
broad cross section of society, which is something that, again, like the COPS and the World Economic Forum convenings leave out. We need scientists. We need academics. We need the public. We need those that are actually practicing to all come together to talk about adaptation, because if we don't break down those silos, we're not going to actually see any progress. So these convenings, actually, this is excellent content and excellent gathering of experts, but it's that breaking down of silos and creating these spaces that allow access that I think will result in more movement towards adaptation. So what stood out for you here at the conference? There is no sugarcoating the reality of what we're dealing with here, which I really appreciate. So I think some of that needs to be translated in a way that is going to be received and not result in fear, let's say, when some of this information gets out to the public. But to be totally honest with those who are practicing in this space, I appreciate the directness that a lot of the speakers' keynotes are coming with. Okay, if people want to learn more about We Don't Have Time, what do you recommend? Please check out our website, www.wedonthavetime.org. It is free to join as an individual, as a not-for-profit. So activate your page and get engaged to those that are also working in your space, in your sector, and connect to those around the world who might be facing similar challenges to you or that have overcome some of the challenges that you're dealing with or that you might be able to share your successes and inspire to accelerate some of the solutions you're working on because we don't have time. We need to speed up solutions and overcome this climate crisis together. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Doug. Pleasure as always. Hey, Adapters, I'm back with Dr. John Balbus. I'm the Acting Director of the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity at the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, you gave a fantastic presentation, this conference. What was the title and what were you talking about? Thanks so much for the compliment. The topic was putting the H in resilience. So here we are at an innovations and resilience conference. I come from a health perspective. A lot of times health is left out. So that was the title of the talk was how do we put health into climate change resilience? Tell us about the focus of it. So emergency preparedness with hospitals and what kind of hospitals? You know, our office is working to protect the health of all people in the United States from the health impacts of climate change. There's a lot of different parts and ways to do that. But one of the most important ways to do that is to make sure that the hospitals, especially the hospitals that are serving the most vulnerable populations in the country, stay up and running when the wildfires are going on, when the heat waves are going on, when the hurricanes are coming, when the floods are coming. Part of my talk was about that. It was about how do we make sure that we have a health sector that's really up to the challenges of climate change in the 21st century. A lot of people don't even understand how hospitals work. Are they private hospitals? Are they public hospitals? Who are you engaging with? We're engaging with all, and the nation is served by federal hospitals. It's served by essential and safety net hospitals, some of which have public funding, and most of our health sector is private. Some have more resources than others. You know, a lot of the rural safety net hospitals are really, I mean, all hospitals now are stretched by the, the pandemic, by COVID, but some of the rural safety net hospitals are, are just hanging on by a thread. Our office is really, what we're trying to do is to make a possible for all the hospitals, especially those safety net hospitals, to be able to continue operations, to be able to reduce their energy costs through renewables, which is also part of resilience, to make these things accessible to them, to connect the health sector to the resources that are available to them across the federal government. I imagine, especially even a smaller hospital, they're not necessarily thinking about climate change, even though a hospital probably has to think about contingencies that most of us don't have to think about. Is it you doing outreach to them or are the hospitals reaching out to you? Are they thinking about this? Well, it's some of both. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned, the House Ways and Means Committee actually did an interesting survey, a request for information that they did. And what they found was a lot of hospitals, especially if they're in Florida or Texas or Louisiana, they don't have a choice. They're thinking about climate change because they're experiencing recurrent disasters, major stressors on the system every year. So they're already thinking. A lot of other smaller hospitals, you know, in places in the country that aren't seeing those disasters quite as much aren't thinking about it as much. And, of course, you know, we have to get to the places that are being most affected, that are at ground zero, and that are serving those people who are at risk first. So we're, we're letting people come to us who are looking for these resources, but we're also reaching out to the entire sector. And I think a focus, too, is communities at risk, maybe communities that aren't necessarily getting the attention that normally maybe diverse communities. Can you explain that? Sure. So 
One thing I just want to point out is part of the talk I was talking about the gap and you were saying something about the gap and a lot of the attention in the current system is on the hospitals and there's a hospital protection program but one of the gaps is in the smaller kinds of outpatient ambulatory care clinics like the federally qualified health centers that serve the low income commun communities in this country. So that's partly where the connection is, is to make sure that the clinics and the outpatient centers especially those serving low-income communities, are part of the ecosystem, that they are supported in their own resilience so they don't go down and then the people that they serve are left without access to care or having to go into the emergency rooms of the bigger hospitals. And I think hospitals are these unique things. And you hear about a lot of local governments, and they're trying to do the right things. And they're thinking, they're planning out, they're working with climate modeling groups. Okay, sea level rise, wildfires. But a hospital actually has to take that next step and maybe commit resources. I mean, how are they doing that? Are they working with those kind of groups? Do you provide those kind of services? All right, what's this hospital going to be doing in 2070? Yeah, well, there's a lot of questions in there. So right. the first blush is, you know, hospitals that are in hurricane zones that are in California, for example, where, you know, utilities are having to brown out and decrease the load on the grid so the grid doesn't go down. These hospitals are already experiencing energy challenges, right? So there is a requirement from Medicare that every hospital has to have backup power under the emergency preparedness rule. But there's a lot of innovation going on now. So a lot of hospitals that are in those places for example, they're starting to create solar renewable on-site generation with backup power and microgrids. If the grid goes down, they not only have a backup energy source, it's typically a diesel generator, but a lot of them are now doing backup battery power, but they have ongoing generation there so that they don't have to rely just on storage of fuel. They can actually have microgrids in isolation. So that's just one way all these things come together. Hospitals are innovating on this, and the federal government now is starting to support a lot of renewable energy deployment. Okay, so let's just talk about the conference now. What, what has stood out for you? Any presentations? Any conversations? You know, this is a conference that brings together all the different sectors, and that's been a really interesting part is to compare the different sectors, to hear about the innovations going on. The panel yesterday on climate innovation fact or fiction was really provocative and, and uplifting. It's been really great to, to hear the perspectives of the different sectors. If people want to learn more about what you're up to, where should they go? quickest way would be just to Google OCHI, but our actual URL is going to be hhs.gov slash O-C-C-H-E. I'll have the link in my show notes for this episode so people can easily find it. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Hey, doctors, I'm with Melinda Sitch. Okay, where do you work? I work for Battelle Memorial Institute. I'm the senior vice president of the commercial business. Okay, so let's talk about some of the work that you're doing. Partnerships is a big part of what you do when you're looking to figure out how Battelle is going to help people out there. Kind of give us part of that process. Yeah, so we look to find the right, what we would call a lighthouse partner or some type of industry partner and bring them into our business to develop innovation in mission-centric areas that we believe will make a difference. Okay, can you maybe give us a couple examples of focus areas for you? Sure. So particularly like specific to climate resilience, we work in the agricultural industry looking to bring new innovation into areas where we might solve issues related to food security or water challenges, water supply. So we bring partners together to solve really complicated problems where we might need expertise in a variety of areas. And then we leverage Battelle's research and development capabilities and science capabilities across what we call our enterprise capabilities. So biology, advanced materials and chemistry, coupled with engineering and analytics to develop solutions, quite frankly, that we believe no one else can. So has this conference been helpful to you as you think about even working with future partners? Yeah, I mean, there's some really interesting people in the rooms here. So we've got a variety of scientists as well, like coming from out of the government as well as academia. And then we have a ton of industry professionals here at a level that we think is right to start to address some of those problems together. 
I actually have a lot of listeners that are in the private sector. They're in government. Are you guys looking for future partnerships? How's that operate? Yeah, so we're always looking for future partnerships. We're really interested in working with people that are purpose-driven or mission-driven that have the type of science and analytic background that would allow us to partner and bring commercial solutions out into the market. For me, I focus on the commercial market for Battelle. We have other people on the team that focus on government-centric solutions. And we try to bring the best of those worlds together to develop solutions that we might not otherwise be able to develop in if we're only focused on one part of that market, for example. If people want to learn more about working with you, working with Patel, what do you recommend? I definitely recommend reaching out to us. Frankly, we have a great website. We have lots of social media talking about the things that we're doing and the missions that we're driving. Reaching out to us to partner with us, we're super interested. We're very active in the conference circuit around climate and environmental initiatives. And you can see people and experts representing Batal all over. Okay, thanks for joining the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, Adapters, we're back, and I'm with... Pranjal Gupta at Duke University. Okay, so what do you do there at Duke? I'm currently a PhD student. I study computational neuroscience, and so I do real-time machine learning systems for neuroscience experiments. But I've been thinking about climate change since I started graduate school, and now that I'm ready to graduate, I am looking for a place to jump in and apply my skills. Wow, you sound a lot smarter than I am. (laughs) That sounds very complicated. Why are you here at the conference? Well, I heard about the conference through your podcast, Doug, so, you know, thank you for getting me here. But I'm really here to network, really just to meet everybody in this industry. I'm completely new, and I know that there is a good application for machine learning, but I need to really figure out what is actually going on. So I've just been here talking to people, asking all the, you know, the various leaders here, what do you think are good applications for my skills? And I've gotten a lot of networking into. There's been a lot of people that are looking for internships and jobs and things like that. Tell me some highlights about these conversations that are going to be relevant to the work that you hope to do. Yeah, definitely. So the one conversation I had was it really actually opened my mind to the the possibilities of how you could apply machine learning and data science to really aid adaptation efforts and resilience efforts. And, you know, one of the conversations was about applying my skills for actually advocacy and really, you know, conservation, things that I, you know, most people wouldn't really immediately think about is, oh, I should do machine learning for these things. But that really was an amazing conversation. It really instilled a lot of confidence in me where it was like, you know, I feel like a newcomer coming in. But these people I've been talking to, they're really like, there are so many different ways that your work could be impactful for us in delivering these data insights to people who are actually really making decisions. So I think the real highlight for me was just amazing reaction from people like telling me that there's this opportunity here, there's this opportunity here. And that's just been really, really positive. That's great in that you have a very technical skill and you are seeing a place for yourself in the adaptation space. And I'm I'm very encouraged because I'm discovering all these people out here doing adaptation work. So again, let's dig into that a little bit more deeply. It's like you're getting a job and an ideal situation. How is your skill being applied on the ground? Because I know you don't want to be doing something that's just sort of hypothetical or like that? How is it actually being applied? Give us, okay, because I'm trying to get a listener out there using their imagination on how they would work with someone like you. I see. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, my skills specifically are in real-time systems. So we get data from a neuroscience experiment and we analyze it immediately and we show the results to the experimenters while it's happening so that they can actively sort of mess with and adapt their experiment, really accelerating that process. And so translating that into the climate space, you know, there's a lot of of really, really big tools that are coming up for these various risk predictions or for storms that are coming in, what are the runoff, things like that, fires. And so a lot of things that I've been talking to people is that we sort of have all this data and we kind of can tell some of these things are coming beforehand, but the problem is getting that information quickly and in an interpretable way to people who actually sort of allocate resources during these emergencies. And so I think you know that's the thing that's really inspired me is that I can actually build a system that takes various kinds of data from all over the place, whether it's historical climate data or weather data or real-time stuff or even projecting data into the future and really 
getting interpretable insights from it immediately, like very quickly, and getting that to people who need it. That's the thing I've really been struck by. A lot of people have been saying that we have all these data sets and we have, you know, no translation from that or very sort of uninterpretable translation from those data sets to the people who are actually making decisions. And so that seems like the real opportunity where my skills could come in is I can build a system that immediately, as soon as you get sensor readings, every 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, update the model and give that information immediately to people who might be making decisions. Any highlights with presentations that you've seen? I think probably the coolest thing I've seen so far was uh, the subsea data systems they're working on. There's a network. I didn't even know this. Most internet traffic that's intercontinental actually goes through these underwater cables. And he's working on developing cables that have sensors in them so that we can actually get deep sea, like deep ocean sensor readings in pl for places we never would be able to get that information from. And that was like wild to me. That was like, it seems like science fiction. We're just kind of laying sensors everywhere. And, you know, he was talking about getting really accurate tsunami predictions where, you know, the current system is just not close enough. And so that was a little bit application with real time data science as well, where it's like really real time monitoring. That whole idea just was like, it felt like science fiction to me. It was just really cool. All right. Thanks for coming on the podcast and good luck with what you're doing. Thank you so much, Doug. I really appreciate it. Hey, Adapters. I'm back, and I'm with... Ashley Nguyen, and I'm a high school senior from Westminster High School from Southern California. Okay, you're here for a special reason. Why is that? I recently won as National Grand Winner for the Patel Climate Challenge Innovation, and I'm here to present my research and attend the conferences. All right, so let's hear about this research. This is pretty exciting. I looked it over, and when I was in high school, I was not doing anything of consequence, and you did this amazing thing. Briefly describe what the project was. So recently, climate change has been impacting coastal communities, increasing sea level rise. And so natural buffers, specifically eel grass, have helped stabilize sediments and plants against erosion. And so to increase that population, I proposed Seed Bomb, a more cost-effective, simple, and sustainable seed-based restoration method that increases the germination rate of eelgrass and, in general, helps mitigate sea level rise. It's basically a ball made out of sea mud, clay, silt, and sea water, and divers can bury them right directly into the estuary site, which would then help increase the population size of eelgrass. So anybody back where you're at wanting to use this? Currently, in my area, Southern California, there is a eelgrass restoration site called the Upper Newport Bay, and they actually have some eelgrass restoration projects, but I look into more about those, and they aren't as effective because they're either laborious, costly, or they damage the microenvironment. And so I would most likely propose my idea to that restoration area and also outreach to a lot of local middle school and high school students to help volunteer to create this seed bomb. Okay, so you're going to head off to college soon. Do you have ambitions to keep doing coastal resilience, coastal adaptation in the future? Yes. So I hopefully plan to go to either UC San Diego or any other schools that will hypothetically accept me. But UC San Diego, they have a really great oceanography school, which they promote a lot about marine biology and estuary. So I hopefully that with the resources, I could bring my idea to reality. Okay, so you're here at this Patel conference. They flew you in so you could be part of this and get the award. You've been here for the, the whole duration. What have you learned? I learned a lot. There were so many incredible speakers and also the attendees. They were really wonderful to talk to. I think one of the key takeaway that I took away from this conference was one the session that talked about CRISPR technology that really resonated with me because last year I did something related to agriculture and CRISPR technology. And so I really extended my knowledge and that's something that I really took on and hopefully carry on with me when I go to college. And so one of the things that you got as part of this with this award is that they're offering an internship. Is this something you're going to do? I hope I could take on this opportunity, but most likely I hope I will. So, yes. All right. So congratulations. And just it's incredible. You're a young person. And I'm very enthusiastic that you're going to be heading into the adaptation space, hopefully, and bringing your intelligence to try to conquer some of these big problems. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. And I also want to say this quickly, that even if you're young or you might not feel like 
you're not capable, you really are. And I think that climate change really requires all age and background to really contribute to mitigate this type of challenge that we're in. And we need more future generations to kind of not to incorporate sustainability in regardless any field you are in. I think that it's really important to start now and it's never too late. Fantastic. Hey, Adapters, I'm back, and I'm with... John Conger. Okay, where do you work? I work in a lot of places. I have my own consulting firm, but I also am the Director Emeritus of the Center for Climate and Security. So you gave a presentation here. What was that about? I'm talking about how the administration can get from words to deeds, how they can actually get from the plans they're writing up to actions and to actually start doing the things they need to do in order to make progress. Okay, so you actually have a long history in this space. You've worked for government. Walk us through a bit of that, your own experiences doing adaptation planning. Sure. I worked for a dozen years on Capitol Hill, and then I went to the Pentagon. I was I did a bunch of different jobs in the Pentagon, but I was in charge of energy installations and environment and that whole portfolio. So it had about a, a trillion-dollar real estate portfolio that I was responsible for, all the military bases. And then after that, I was the deputy comptroller, so I was the number two money guy at DOD. While I was there, climate became a fairly large issue. And so I was, for lack of a better description, DOD's climate guy. I was the person that when there was an interagency climate meeting, they would send me over to meet at the White House with the other federal agencies to talk climate issues. So that's where I started. Later went over to the Center for Climate and Security. I was the director there for a little while. And now it's Aaron Sikorsky, who you've had on your program a number of times. So I think we actually were probably at some of the same meetings during the Obama years when a lot of that early adaptation planning was happening between the agencies. What are your observations? I thought so much progress was being made then, and then it seems like we're almost starting from scratch for a lot of federal agencies, even now with the Biden administration. So what are your some observations over that time period? I would say that if you're going to, if you're actually going to take adaptation seriously in a federal agency, there's four steps that I've observed. First step is to acknowledge the problem. We did a lot of problem acknowledging when we were during the Obama administration, getting people to realize that they had to deal with this. The second part is to develop guidance because you cannot manage these huge organizations without writing the rules down. And so we did a lot of guidance writing at the DOD back then because you can't expect a lieutenant at a base to know what the assistant secretary said yesterday. You have to have it all written down. And then the third part is planning. Planning is where they're at right now, and planning is something they're not all terrific at. They need some focused attention there. They're in the middle. They should be farther along, but that's where they're at. And then the fourth part is actually executing projects, getting the resources and executing. That's to come. That's not here yet. There is legislation to pass a national adaptation plan, and your own experiences in government and even in Congress. Do you see value in such a plan at the moment? Should we even do it? Yes, I think that's incredibly important. And in fact, that was one of the recommendations that the Center for Climate and Security had in its most recent report called Challenge Accepted. You should all Google it and go read it. But the National Adaptation Plan is really important. Why? Because when we spend the amount of money the federal government spends on any given year, especially on infrastructure, it is like a missile without a guidance system. To actually be able to take the environment into account and to do the things that need to be done and to steer, that's the value added that it brings to the table. It'll identify some projects, but more than anything else, I would love to see it create the lens that all of the projects that we're already going to do have to go through so that we're not doing things that are stupid and have to be reversed. So what about this conference? What are some highlights for you? You know, it's really interesting to hear the scientific community come in and talk about their different projects and to articulate the challenges that they're going to be running into with regard to adaptation. I think we've heard several things from the security perspective. One of the more interesting talks I heard yesterday talked about the mismatch between critical minerals available and supply chains and what we need to get to in order to solve the problem if we're just using solar and wind to lower emissions. And so, you know, how do you adapt what you imagine to be the solution based on the world around you? We have to adapt on a number of levels in order to get where we need to go. Okay, can you just quickly describe some of the opportunities that come up? Because your own experience as government and mine, if there's not a budget associated with even some of the policies and planning, it's like, okay, this isn't even for real. The IRA, the infrastructure spending bill, there's actually some real money out there. What are some of these opportunities that we could see? So there's some real money, and I think that there's a lot of budget resources. You know, tax breaks are important in steering the general public, but that's not appropriated dollars. I think that the infrastructure bill is a real opportunity because they – 
created that filter that the projects have to go through in order to get spent, there is resilience money in there as well. If I am thinking about an adaptation and resilience perspective, I'm thinking more about the infrastructure bill than the IRA, in all honesty. One of the things that I felt was disappointing in both of those bills was that they shut DOD out. DOD has more infrastructure than the rest of the government put together, and yet DOD was not included in the grant programs and so on that received the extra funding in in those bills. I think that was a missed opportunity, in all honesty. But there are places like FEMA and uh, NOAA and a a lot of other agencies that did get some resilience money, and and we'll see that get spent going forward. That'll be good. Okay, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Hey, Adapters, I'm back, and I'm with... Mike Janis. Okay, where do you work? I work with Patel. All right, so you're with Patel. That's why we're all here. What do you do with Patel? I'm the general manager of our Environment and Infrastructure Business Unit, so we really do everything associated with safety and security of both the natural environment and the built environment. Okay, what about issues related to climate impact and, like, climate adaptation? There's wildfires out there. There's sea level rise. Is this emerging as an issue that you're covering? No, absolutely. And one of the programs that I just mentioned, for example, NEON, which stands for the National Ecological Observatory Network, that is a program in which we have 81 sites throughout the country collecting significant amounts of climate data, 5.6 billion points a day, and that technology is used to for example, look at the issues associated with wildfires. I mean, look at the issues all across the country from Alaska to Hawaii to Puerto Rico. So we're in areas where there's been hurricanes, where there's been flooding, where there's been wildfires. And this consistent data that we're collecting all over the country is highly beneficial to start addressing not only the definition of the problem, but also what solutions might work. Adaptation, resilience, these are actually emerging issues. They haven't been around so long. And even groups like your your huge organization, you have clients like the federal government, and they're still trying to figure out what their needs are. How do you have those conversations with your clients like that around this emerging issue? Sure. A lot of those conversations occur with organizations like the National Science Foundation with the Department of Energy. And those conversations in some cases are around what work can we do to help define the problem? Um, and that's what we do, for example, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then the other bucket of conversations, which this conference is actually about, is around how do we define solutions. So there's a lot of time spent talking about requirements, both from a technical standpoint, both from a cost standpoint, and also from a standpoint of how we impact in the communities that we work, Justice 40 and other issues. How do we ensure that we're balancing all of those requirements to develop solutions that will be widely applicable? One of the things I didn't know before I came here was that you managed all these national labs. And these national labs, they've been giving presentations, and they're creating a lot of resources out there. A lot of folks in my space just didn't realize it. Is there more interest from them, I guess, sharing their tools and getting out there, I guess, being leaders in the space of what they, they're providing the public? Yeah, the, uh, the DOE national labs play a tremendous role in informing the public and also really helping to define the problems. Our national labs do a lot of work on what we refer to as basic research. So they're doing a lot of the fundamental work that once again helps define the problem and they also work very, very closely with all the communities in which they're locating, helping those communities to understand these problems. Okay, so we're at this conference. What's been standing out for you? Yeah, there's been a lot of things that have stood out. If you take a look at some of the presentations that have been done, for example, Tammy Ma and the work that she talked about from Lawrence Livermore that she has done with Fusion. If you take a look at the work that's been done by the NSF and Linnea Avalone and all of the investments that the NSF is making to ensure that we really understand the climate problem. If you take a look at our speaker from DOE, Dr. Murray, and all of the work that's being done around earth shots, whether it's hydrogen, wind power, etc. I was very excited. We had our climate challenge winner here that we provided them their award at the start of the conference. So it was exciting to see that the, the next generation of scientists are already forming in our middle schools and in our high schools. So there's been um, a lot of excitement from my standpoint. Okay, so this is the second conference that you guys have done. It's my sense that you're committed to this topic, and hopefully there'll be future conferences. Any ideas percolating in your head of what you might cover in a future conference? Yeah, I think you're going to continue to see an emphasis on innovation. But Tell really focuses not so much on what I would call defining the problem. We really focus on what are those innovative solutions that are going to be transformative. So what we're trying to do with this conference is constantly stay five years, ten years ahead, not so much necessarily focusing on what's going on today, Day, but what can we do that's going to help five and ten years from now? Okay, thanks for coming on the podcast. No, my pleasure. Thank you. Hey, Adapters, I'm back and I'm with... 
Monica Serrano with Turner Construction. I lead our resilience program. Tell us a bit about that. What makes you do adaptation work there at Turner? I focus on three pillars mostly. It's about incorporating resilience in the buildings that we build for our clients, in the construction phase, so our job sites, and our operations. So think of supply chain, our people, how we run jobs. So you, you've actually been on the podcast before. Tell us about that. I have. We reviewed about six months worth of episodes. We were discussing with Sean Martin. I'm a big listener. I'm a big fan. There are not many podcasts out there, not many venues where we can learn about adaptation. So it has been an honor. Well, it's a treat for me. I, I, we met online and then we had that episode, but I actually get to meet you in person. So that's just fantastic for me. All right, let's talk a bit about your role here. You were involved with a couple of poster presentations. That's right. I brought two posters. One poster is focused on resilience in the commercial real estate sector. I collaborated with three other women and we looked at it from four lenses, insurance, litigation, design, and construction. And so we're highlighting what is happening in the insurance sector when it comes to climate adaptation. What is, you know, are the premiums going up? The answer is yes. Are some insurers pulling out of the market? Yes. And what they're requiring from different clients in the terms of incorporating resilience in the real estate sector. The other lens is litigation. Jessica Medersen highlights how she expects more litigation related to climate change in the future. She's a bit ad advocate to incorporating resilience to just simply avoid litigation, which is expensive and time consuming. Holly Niever with AEI Consultants highlights the ASTM property resilience assessment that we have been working on for a couple of years now. And it's a great framework to look at how, what hazards affect buildings, evaluating vulnerability and risk, and then incorporating resilience in a building. And I brought two case studies to projects that are under construction right now that incorporate resilience. One project is the Commonwealth Pier Project in Boston, Massachusetts, in the seaport. That's an interesting case study. It's a building that dates back to the 1900s, and it's being majorly retrofitted to incorporate resilience and be prepared for floods in 2017. And the other case study is the Coney Island Hospital, which is, again, under construction, and it's incorporating resilience in the ways of the ER space is on the second floor, the critical equipment serving the entire campus is on the fifth floor, including the utility transformer, and we also incorporated some resilient measures during the construction phase. And that was one poster. My other poster, I collaborated with Keith Bryan with BSI, British Standards Institute, and we focus on climate risk and how companies can follow these three steps to assess both their physical and climate risk frameworks that they can follow as we believe that it is needed for all companies out there, not just in the financial sector. This is where the climate risk conversation started. It is important for all companies to take a look at climate risk as part of their risk management process. Okay, you have somewhat of a unique position there at Turner. Not a lot of private corporations have hired someone who's focusing on adaptation, resilience. Tell us a bit about your experiences dealing with other people in the private sector because there's confusion over people doing sustainability and even resilience and adaptation. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, I spent a lot of my time differentiating resilience and sustainability, and not to say that one is more important than the other. Both of them are. Climate crisis is a very, very big crisis, and so we have to both mitigate and adapt, right? I think it's common knowledge that if we stopped emitting carbon today, there would be decades of effects from climate change, and that's where adaptation comes in. And we're seeing the effects of climate change today, and we'll continue to see them for decades. But there is confusion. There is confusion. I, I start talking about resilience, and people say, oh, energy, oh, carbon. And so, yes, there is confusion. And I think it's very important to delineate what is mitigation, what is adaptation, what is resilience, what is sustainability, not only in the building sector, but everywhere. Seems like a lot of people have a different definition of resilience, and sometimes it's not even associated with climate change at all. That's right, yes. So depending on who I'm talking to, I will say resilience in the construction sector and resilience in the building sector. I was talking to somebody the other day, and the whole time he was thinking that I was talking about personal resilience. So it is really important to define what you mean by resilience. You're here at this conference. Tell us a bit about some of the presentations and your experiences here. So the conference has been great. I have learned a lot. It has been a great platform between academia and what all these climate scientists are doing and the private sector. I think that there is a huge need for communicating what academia is doing and all these cool and innovative ideas in the adaptation sector are taking place, but then bring them to the private sector and scale them. I was a little surprised that there has been a lot of talk of energy, and don't get me wrong, energy efficiency is needed, but if this is a resilience and adaptation conference, I wish there was more focus on adaptation alone right at hardening or you know how do we adapt to a changing climate you know how do we adapt to our future and i guess with that point those are two different sectors two different types of people working in the different spaces right 
Yes, yes, there is. There may be some overlaps, like slight overlaps, right? So think of the energy grid shutdowns in California or what happened in Texas last year during the freeze. And yes, that is energy resilience, but that is just such a small piece of the pie in the resilient sector that there's so many other things we can talk about beyond energy. And energy really has to do with mitigation, right? Decarbonizing. Well, I think Patel wants to stay in the resilient space and be a leader there. Any advice to them for future conferences? Yeah, and just to start saying that I appreciate the spotlight they have, just the fact that they have made this conference is wonderful. There are not many conferences or platforms where we can just talk adaptation. My advice would be enhance, just talk more about adaptation, right, and less energy. Let's just talk about how do we adapt to a changing climate from all aspects, right, buildings, communities, what innovations are needed to create a more adaptable future. All right. What I find very exciting is that you and a colleague are thinking of starting an adaptation podcast. Give us a preview of that, and I will be certain to harass you to make sure you're going to actually do the podcast. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, Jessica Meters and the construction lawyer I alluded to earlier and I are planning to start a podcast focused on resilience in the building sector. I mean, you are the only podcast that I I listen to consistently that has adaptation. America Adapts is the only podcast that provides knowledge and expertise and communications on adaptation. And so we see the need for more. We have to have more conversations. We have to communicate all these great things that are happening in the adaptation sector. And we thought a podcast would be a perfect venue for it. So stay tuned and thank you for keeping me accountable. Well, I'm very excited to get some company in this adaptation space. I think it's needed and we need different voices coming at it from different experiences. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for the opportunity. Hey, Adapters, I'm back, and I'm with... Taylor Dimsdale. Okay, and who do you work with? Forz Marsh. What do you guys do there? Forz Marsh has been around for a while. It's been 2002. It's a behavioral and social science research B Corporation. So we do all sorts of data analysis, behavioral science, social science, communications, research, project evaluation, all to do with things like climate resilience, disaster response and prevention, those sorts of issues. Forz Marsh also works on technology, on the health sector, quite a broad range of issues. But we have a climate resilience division and have worked historically with FEMA, for example, on, again, helping them with their strategy around disaster response, helping people after disasters, climate risk perception of consumers, those kinds of things. Okay, can you give me a bit more detail, maybe a particular case study? Was there a state, a particular government you were working with FEMA with? It's with the U.S. So, for example, we've helped FEMA with something called their National Preparedness Assessment Division. We do things like grants evaluation. So it's, so FEMA gives out a lot of grants to communities to help with disaster preparedness and response. We examine those grants to make sure that the money is being spent well. It's reaching the people that it should be reaching. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's that kind of work. So why are you at this conference? So I'm at this conference because I'm a senior research fellow on climate resilience at Forest Marsh. It's very interesting for me to see, you know, what's the cutting edge of climate resilience data, research, engineering, what are the national laboratories doing? They're at the forefront of the research and development, figuring out how you help communities be prepared for climate impacts. I'm particularly interested, given my position, in matching that with the human side of the equation. So you can have the the best model in the world, the most elegant policy. You need to make sure that that's something that's tailored towards what people actually care about, how they behave, towards more of the social sciences. So I've been particularly interested in some of the sessions around how you frame some of these issues so that people listen and understand what some of these tools are capable of doing, how they can actually help people on a day-to-day basis. It was actually news to me. I wasn't familiar with the, what the national labs are doing. Have you worked with them? Was that, I mean, were you talking to these people here? I have been talking to the national labs. It's something I've followed for a pretty long time in my career. Again, I think that they are often really at the cutting edge of what you know, research is capable of providing in terms of strengthening resilience, in terms of climate data analysis. I've been impressed, uh, you know, at some of the work that they're doing on 
building climate risk management frameworks, for example, really thinking about how you get very local in terms of helping one particular organization or institute, infrastructure for government departments, for example, prepare for very you know specific kinds of climate impacts. I think it's getting very localized, which has been really encouraging. They're starting to talk really like site-specific measures that you can take to prepare for some of these impacts, whether it's flood or wildfires or drought or what have you. So I think, you know, it's been impressive to see some of the innovations in that space over the past, even just the past few years. Any highlights? So I think there was a session yesterday on essentially behavioral science and communication. So again, we have all of these amazing tools. Increasingly, there's a lot of data available. You're starting to see better decision support tools that will allow decision makers to take that data and actually turn it into a set of policy options. But again, to make sure that all of that is effective, you need to think very carefully about how the human mind works, what resonates with people, how you appeal to people from different backgrounds who have different priorities. So I think it's really critical to think about the messaging and the framing around some of these issues to make sure the tools and the data and the research is actually being used in local communities by individuals, because otherwise it's not exactly wasted resources, but you're certainly not using them the most effectively. People want to learn more about your company. Where should they go? So they can go to forsmarsh.com is probably the best place, but Forsmarsh is on social media, so LinkedIn or Twitter, but forsmarsh.com is a good option. I'll include a link in my show notes. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. So I am checking in with Patel post-conference, and Lisa Abaddon, the Director of Marketing and Communications with Patel, is joining me. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Good to talk to you. We're recording this after the conference, so we both of us have had a chance to kind of digest what happened there. First off, what were some of the main takeaways that you took from the conference? So many great highlights. One of the key takeaways that we found was really that collaborative spirit that ran throughout the conference. When you have academia, government, and industry together in one room, and people who are leading the charge, people who are leading conversations and driving ideas, it really had an effect. It had an effect on the audience. It impacted conversations. And we had feedback that more conversations are taking place beyond the conference. And that's exciting. I got to meet a lot of Patel people and a lot of them were there in attendance. How did the conference resonate with Patel employees that were able to attend? You know, they came away with exciting ideas. They came away with connections and they were really energized. They were energized by some of the innovations that were taking place, some of which have already launched, but others that are really emerging. And so they had the opportunity to have deeper discussions, to explore possibilities that they wouldn't have had that opportunity if they hadn't been there. It's exciting. You can never predict who's actually going to attend a conference. So who were some of the attendees? And of course, you're not going to be able to say them all here, but any sort of surprises of the type of people that showed up? You know, one of the groups that showed up were varied, of course, but we really enjoyed some of the graduate students that showed up. They came from a couple of universities and one of which heard about the conference from your show. So that was exciting. But they came with this openness, this excitement to learn. And they spent time getting to know the other conference attendees and shared some of their thoughts. And these are the people who are our future. These are the future scientists, the future researchers. And we want more. That was a great surprise. Yeah. And just my own thoughts on that. It, I was really surprised too. I mean, first off, Patel, I learned you guys do so much stuff. You guys are involved with so many different things. And I didn't really even know anybody from the national labs. And I think some of these people are Patel employees. Some of them are contracted. And it was just fascinating to see the diversity of people there. And like, I've been going to the national adaptation forum, which attracts a lot of different folks, but there was definitely a, a different type of resilience and adaptation person attending these. And I thought that was really interesting. And there's some really technical people out there doing this work and they gravitated toward this conference. And I don't know if you saw that. 
I did see that. And, and they ranged, didn't they? I mean, they really, some of them were diving into AI. Others were looking at modeling in ways that will impact farming. And we heard about that from someone from Microsoft, Ranveer Chandra. There was a diverse range of ideas and innovations. And I feel like we're just tapping the surface. Speaking of those national labs, again, what stood out to me, and I saw some of the presentations by people from the national labs, and they're creating these tools and they even these climate modeling tools. When I would talk to attendees, they're just like, holy cow, I didn't even know th- th- these national labs were doing that. And that's partly why you're having the conference in the first place, because there's all this great work being done at those labs. But n- people don't necessarily know that Patel is in the middle of this, right? We are. We're very involved. In fact, Patel has a managing role in nine of the national labs. And our role is to enable that science to help drive that from the back end, from the operations standpoint, from the management standpoint, so that that science continues to move and advance. And it's exciting what's happening. David Judy, who is the director of Earth System Science at the Pacific Northwest National Lab, he gave a very interesting presentation of their new Earth System processes. And the group just announced a new website that they've made available. So if listeners are interested in some of the science and some of the platforms that that team is working on, they can go to the PNN L website and check it out. For you personally, what takeaways did you have? And like, are you going to do anything different? Are you to give you some creative thoughts on what you were going to do over, I guess, the next year coming out of talking about resilience there? Yeah, we walked away with many ideas, one of which will be, we're talking about having another conference. Patel is actively involved in climate resilience in the science and technology development. And oftentimes people don't know that. And so Patel's mission is to move and propel and advance science forward so that benefits society. And part of hosting a conference like this is living our mission. So what we would like to see is future conferences is much like this one with more technology, more innovation that's being shared. And as I mentioned earlier, having that next generation of scientists attend and become actively involved in a conference like this, it would give them an opportunity to grow and to experience that expertise that's out there in the world. Who is responsible for the food? Because it was spectacular. You guys had... (laughs) Great coffee breaks. You had, you fed us. Oh, here's a snack afterward. They weren't snacks. It was like dinner food. It was amazing. So uh, (laughs) kudos to whoever was in charge of that. Yeah, we have an amazing conference planning organizing team. And I know you were able to meet some of those people and they're just, they're spectacular. And They're just organized and just fabulous to work with. So we are going to actively have more sponsors get involved because they're important to have in conferences like this. It helps to raise the conversation. It helps us expand that conversation and reach. This year, we had GHD. We had Google Cloud. We had UPenn of Environmental Studies Program. And we had the Native American Agricultural Fund. They all became sponsors. Some of them sponsored our coffee breaks. Some of them sponsored our poster sessions, which took place at the end of each day and should really showcase some great work. I just want to give a shout out to our sponsors this year. Fantastic. Before I let you go, if people want to learn more about what Patel is up to and, and focus on this area of climate resilience, what would you recommend? Go to our website, www.patel.org. And do some searching. We are involved in so many aspects of science and research that it will surprise you. It ranges from national security to health to environment and infrastructure. And we have areas that are just astonishing to me when I learn about them. So please do join us and reach out with questions. All right, fabulous. And in the show notes, I'll have links to Patel, but also have links to the actual conference too, so people can poke around and, and see what was said there and all the speakers and such. So we can easily do that. So Lisa, again, it's been fantastic partnering with Patel and thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, thanks, Doug. It's been a pleasure working with you and we'll be looking forward to listening to this episode. Thanks.
Hey, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks for Lisa for coming on and highlighting what went on at the conference. As you can see, Battelle recruited a diverse set of speakers. It was enlightening to see the diversity of experts at the conference. I've been to the National Adaptation Forum and a couple regional adaptation forums, and this definitely had a much different perspective on the adaptation field. I asked quite a few people had they been to the National Adaptation Forum, and most had not. And for many, it was the first time they even heard of the event. So that's exciting that Patel is tapping into a different audience of professionals that see resilience and adaptation as increasingly relevant to their work. Patel is prepping for a 2024 version of their Innovations and Resilience Conference and I'll be staying in touch with them as that unfolds. Definitely check out the show notes to learn more about the guests I had in this episode and more information about the conference. And thanks again to Patel for sponsoring America Adapts to tell their story. The spectrum of work they're doing in the resilient space is impressive, and I have a feeling it's just the tip of the iceberg for them in the coming years. And special thanks to the staff at Patel for helping me out with my time at the conference. You guys have a great team, incredibly nice, and they made my job much more productive. It's not always easy getting the interviews you need over a short time span of a few days, but the Patel team really helped with that. And special thanks to Lisa Avedon and Ian McConnell at Patel. They were the ones who originally reached out to me, and it's been a fabulous partnership. Okay, so you just heard I partnered with Patel in this episode to tell their adaptation story. Are you struggling to effectively communicate your climate adaptation story to the right audience? Are you finding that traditional methods such as webinars and white papers are not resonating with people and promoting your work? If so, consider telling your story through a podcast podcast. Sponsoring an episode of America Apps is a great way to focus on the work you're doing and share it with climate professionals from around the world. Personally, go on location and record these sponsored podcasts, which allows for a diverse range of guests to participate. You'll work with me to identify these experts who can represent the amazing work you're doing. Past partners have included the Natural Resources Defense Council, University of Pennsylvania at Warden, World Wildlife Fund, UCLA, Harvard, and various corporate clients. By sharing your story with my listeners who are some of the most influential people in the adaptation space, you'll have the opportunity to reach a wider audience. And additionally, podcasts have a long shelf life, making them a valuable addition to your communication strategy. There's no better way to get your message about adaptation out to some of the most active and influential professionals in the world than through this podcast. Reach out. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Also, if you're interested in having me keynote speak at your conference or corporate event, please reach out. More and more sectors are realizing they need to start thinking about climate adaptation. And for many in those fields, they have very little exposure to resilience and adaptation planning. I can speak to this issue and help you create awareness in your sector. I've been doing keynote presentations for a while. I share stories from the podcast and my experts and my own experiences in adaptation. I will talk about adaptation in ways that will motivate and inspire your conference attendees. You can contact me at my website, americadapts.org. Before we wrap up, you know it's coming. I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. Send me an email. Let me know what you do. If you work in this space or thinking about getting into it, it's very useful to me to hear from you, to know how the podcast is providing value. It is the highlight of my week, and sometimes it can lead to really cool things. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.